I wanted to welcome and say thank you for having me today. And by way of overview, my presentation will have uh, two components. The first component is going to be dealing with good faith and the duty to act honestly in the performance of contracts. And the second part will deal with the timeliness of delay claims and the costs of a delay claim included in a claim for lien. Before we get started, however, the last time I spoke with Brendan in December, he mentioned his grandmother in the content of the law of tendering. So I wanted to mention a short story of the client I never had. The client I never had is my father, who is a residential home builder for over 50 years. Never had a claim for lien, never been sued um, for failing to pay. When I was asked to speak on this duty, to honest, duty of honesty and good faith, I asked him how he avoided um, having to call me for advice uh, since I, I, I practice in this area of law. And his advice or his reasons were very simple. He hired honest trades who did good work, and he in turn was honest, paid them fairly, and paid them on time. Idealistic answer, perhaps he avoided litigation for 50 years. I don't even think he has a contract that extends more than one or two pages, and he builds uh, multi-million dollar homes. So although he's a small home builder and likely uh, had very simplistic uh, contracts, uh, good faith being his answer is what the Supreme Court of Canada now expects all parties to do in the event of a dispute. Whether the party is dealing with a small home renovation case or a multi-million dollar P3 project, the conduct of the contracting parties, and that's the consultants, the engineers, the owner, everyone who is involved with the project, um, is now going to be, their conduct will be examined under the judicial honesty microscope is what I'm going to um, uh, entitle my talk here. While I'm confident that every member here today and most construction industry players are honest and have the good intentions of performing their contracts in good faith, my goal today is only to make you attuned to the fact that even if you comply with the black written letter of your contract, in the event that there is a dispute, your conduct behind that um, uh, execution of the contract can be examined by a court, and to the extent that it's not found to be honest or in good faith, it could be, um, you could be at risk for finding a liability um, damages. The case that's the focal point of the first part of my talk is the November 2014 case, uh, which is from the Supreme Court, called Basson. In that case, it confirmed there's a general organizing principle of good faith in common law of contract and a specific duty of honesty in the performance of contracts. The Basson case is important because there's a, sorry, there, sorry, I apologize here. It is important because the party in that case fully complied with the terms of the contract. However, it was found liable for damages because the court found its conduct in the performance of the contract to be dishonest. The Basson decision is important because it creates a new liability for parties who enter into contracts and is an important reminder to contracting parties to carefully consider their communications with others and give thoughtful consideration to your internal communications, all in respect of the performance of your contract. While the Basson decision does not impose a duty of loyalty or disclosure or require parties to give up advantages arising from the contract, it does require parties to perform their contractual duties honestly. The Basson decision is only a few months old. However, I can tell you I have seen good faith and honest performance plea, pled in claims, in defenses, and communications between me and opposing counsel. It's now the flavor of the month. I look forward to seeing how this decision will apply to the payment process application, applications for extras, contract termination, claims, the dispute resolution process, and how parties will attempt to modify their contractual terms before they enter into a relationship. 
With respect to contract drafting, I wanted to make you aware that the Supreme Court said that you cannot contract out of the duty. You can modify the duty, and perhaps when you're drafting a contract, you might want to consider what conduct would be um, considered to be uh, in good faith or allowable so that there's no ambiguity as you go through um, uh, your construction project. <clears throat> in addition to the impact of the new duty, I see the possibility of this duty creating tension for people who are employed by various construction uh, players. For example, an employee may have a duty to his em employer to keep things confident. However, while they're on site, the duty created by the Basson decision not to lie when asked about a contract issue could place the employee in a position of conflict, having to balance the, the interest of the employer with the uh, duties imposed upon that person under Basson. How the conflict between those two competing duties will be resolved will be remain to seen as the case law develops. I'm not currently aware of any case or construction case um, that has um, been heard since the Basson decision, uh, but I do know it has been applied on numerous occasions in just contract dispute cases. So what does the term good faith mean? The definition according to Black's Law Dictionary is on the slide before you. And while the key terms in this definition are malice and fraud, I'd like to offer my own not so eloquent definition of good faith. To me, good faith means it's conduct that doesn't stink. It, it passes the stink test. In, stated in the reverse, bad faith is conduct which the court finds to be sufficiently bad to rule in favor of the other side and to punish that specific conduct with an award of damage. May I suggest going forward that parties pause before they take certain steps or reduce comments to writing and ask themselves whether they feel that that conduct or that communication would pass my stink test in the event that a dispute arises. Before we look at the law in Canada, I wanted to jump across the pond and look at some um, concepts of good faith in the UK. In the UK, it is very standard for standard construction form contracts to expressly require parties to perform their duties in a cooperative manner. While contracts that require parties to cooperate and expressly impose a duty of good faith are now very common in the UK, good faith by the court will not be implied. So if the contract is silent on good faith, the court will not imply there's a duty of good faith. A recent article in a UK construction journal clearly stated, good faith concepts will not be parachuted into English law. And two recent UK decisions confirm this statement. There's a 1988 UK decision of Interphoto, and it provides an interesting definition and guide to the good faith concept, and I have highlighted um, the terms of interest in this slide. Can you imagine arguing that you don't have a duty to play fair? Is it not in everyone's interest on a construction project to have fair and open dealings? How would you anticipate opting out of this duty in your contract? In the UK, the courts have indicated that they may be more inclined to impose a duty of good faith where parties enter into long-term contracts which require a high level of communication, cooperation, and performance based on mutual trust and confidence. The courts, however, have been reluctant to impose good faith where there's a one-time commercial dealing. So for example, a one-time supply of material to the site might not have the same level of good faith as a long-term construction project that extends over several months or years. The following two slides I've put in, let's see. I apologize. Oh, the Blue Water case and the Compass case, I apologize, 
Um, I put these in here so that you've got sample good faith clauses in the event that uh, you are drafting your contract and you want to look at what the UK law has looked at and what th those contracts provide. I've given you two examples and they talk about business ethics, honesty, fairness, integrity and cooperation. The latest version of the uh, new engineering contracts, which is the standard form contract, is found in this slide, and they also talk about mutual trust and cooperation. In Australia, Standards Australia has also proposed changes to its standard construction contracts, which requires, and the key wording is, the parties to act reasonably in the spirit of mutual trust and cooperation, and generally in good faith towards each other. Imagine how you could object to these types of terms in your contract. Now back to Canada and the Basson decision. As a result of Basson, there are two new fundamental principles which apply to every contract, including construction contracts. Number one, the parties are under a general obligation to perform contracts in good faith, and that's like, um, Picture it like an overarching principle, not a duty, just a principle. And number two, and this is the important one, the parties have a duty to act honestly in the performance of contracts. The obligation and duty set out in these two sentences are qualified by the words performance of the contract. And under, in other words, there's no standalone duty um, to be honest in the abstract. The duty to be honest is tied to the performance of the contract. While I believe Howard Krupp at this morning uh, covered a bit of uh, the facts in Basson this morning, I want to quickly review, no, oh, he did not, terrific. I would like to review then the facts yep. in some detail. Excellent, okay. It has nothing to do with construction law first. So Can-Am is a dealer of these uh, savings plans and it has various basically salespeople and we'll call them, they're called enrollment directors. Mr. Basson is, is one of their top enrollment directors. Takes 10 years for him to build his sales force and he wins awards and he's just their superstar. The contract provides is a three year term contract and if a party chooses not to renew, they must give six month written notice of their intention not to renew. Oh, wait, there we go. Then we've got Mr. H, we'll call him. He's a competitor of Mr. Basson, also an enrollment director. There's, the court goes through that there's animosity. And prior to um, uh, what, what's gonna happen next, Mr. H approaches Mr. Basson and says, let's have a merger. And Mr. Basson says, no, I don't want, I don't wanna be, you know, have any relationship with you. I just wanna do my own thing. So at the same time, the Securities Commission talks to Can-Am and says, you must appoint an auditor, and I would like an audit of all of your directors. Well, Can-Am has a relationship with Mr. H, and they appoint Mr. H as their auditor. Mr. Basson hears that Mr. H is gonna audit his books and records and confidential business records, and says, no, I don't want a competitor of mine looking at my books. So the key is that Can-Am repeatedly misleads Mr. Basson, and he tells him that Mr. H is going to treat all the information confidential, and he also that Can-Am also tells Mr. Basson that the Security Commission will not allow them to hire somebody independent to do the audit. It has to be Mr. H. Those the court says were un the untruths that were communicated to Mr. Basson. Mr. Basson continues to refuse to allow Mr. H to audit the records, and Can-Am, in turn, threatens to terminate the agreement. In May 2011, in accordance with the wording of the agreement, Can-Am gives its intention not to renew to Mr. Basson. Oh, wait, sorry. There we go. 
The contract is terminated, and by that time, all of Mr. Basson's sales force have gone to go work for Mr. H, and he's forced to take another job uh, with a competitor and at a much lesser, um, uh, less profitable competitor. Mr. Basson sues Can-Am. The trial judge finds that there was an implied duty of good faith when decisions were made regarding the contract renewal and that Can-Am acted dishonestly and misled Mr. Mr. Basson. The Court of Appeal, however, says the contract is very clear on its termination. Can-Am complied with, complied with the letter of the law or the letter of the agreement and they will refuse to imply a duty of good faith. Off they go to the Supreme Court the Supreme Court reverses the Court of Appeal and awards Mr. Basson $87,000 in damages. Now, that's a long fight for $87,000 in damages. So, in, in my opinion, um, it was clearly a matter of principle for Mr. Basson, and he clearly wanted a remedy for the conduct which, in my words, did not pass the stink test. Good faith has been part of the Quebec civil law since the 1990s, and the law provides that every person is bound to exercise his civil rights in good faith, and that no right may be exercised with the intent of injuring another or in excess or unreasonable manner, and therefore contrary to the requirement of good faith. That's actually in their code. In the US, they also have the Uniform Commercial Code, which expressly imposes an obligation of good faith on the parties, and the quote is, it's defined as honesty in fact and the observance of reasonable commercial standards of fair dealing in the trade. In the Supreme Court, they, they do have some quotations on Quebec and the US, and it says it's time for Canada, the rest of Canada to get in step. The two key, key principles enunciated in the Basin are in the next slide, and you'll see it was the good faith contractual performance as the organizing principle, and at the bottom I've highlighted the common law duty to all contracts to act honestly in the performance of their contractual obligations. The basic level of honesty is in this slide, and it says that it, it's not a, uh, you know, it, it will fluctuate. There's a basic level, and depending on where you're, what type of contract you have, it could increase. And they mentioned you can't be deceitful and you can't be misleading. For the construction industry, I've pulled up um, paragraphs 63 and 65 of the decision, and they talk about honestly, reasonably, you can't act arbitrarily, and it requires that a party not seek to undermine the contractual interest of its contracting party in bad faith. Further guidance for people in the construction industry are found in paragraphs 66 and 73, where I've got honesty again, you have to be candid, forthright, and reasonable, but always in the performance of your contract, not in the abstract. You can't knowingly lie, you can't knowingly mislead, but always again in the performance of your contract. At paragraph 93, the Supreme Court summarizes the principles, the organizing principle, and it mentions that it depends on um, the types of situations and the types of relationships. And I've underlined the last um, paragraph here, the particular types of situations, and to me it seems to link to what the UK is going, you know, the, the longer term, uh, more, more um, uh, complex the contract and the construction project, the higher the level of good faith. Oh, sorry. This slide here um, confirms that the duty is not a standalone duty, but it's in fact tied to contractual performance. I don't want you to go away saying I can never lie. Um, you know, it, it's all tied specifically with the contract. 
While lawyers found the Basson decision to be one of the important key contract decisions to come out of the Supreme Court in the past few years, after a bit of digging, I was able to locate a pre-Basson contract case with, which dealt with the concept of good faith. And the case is Urbicon and Guelph, and I will, the decision is 2014. Okay, I'm just gonna give you some highlights. There's, the decision is 162 paragraphs, and it follows 40 days, 40 hearing days scattered throughout several months. The question to be decided in this Urbicon case was simply, when and under what circumstances does a default by a contractor in meeting time milestones for work entitle the owner of the, to terminate the contract and to remove the contractor from site? So that was the issue. Quickly on the facts, so you have a $44 million contract. They used the standard CCDC 2, 1994. The contract has milestones with, um, uh, throughout the course of the project. There are, let's see, there's delays, there's delay claims, there's change notices, requests for change, change directives, um, impact notices, and allegations of delay from, either, from both parties. Okay. In August 15, 2008, the consultant wrote, the artic wrote to the City of Guelph this particular email. Shortly thereafter, on September 8th, September 4th, 2008, the City sends the consultant this particular email. The next day, the City sends the email that I've got quoted, and I've cited you the paragraph that you can find it in the judgment. And it has these comments, basically um, indicating what uh, potential wording in a letter. With respect to the September 5th email, the court said, and this is in the decision, this email is extremely pertinent on issues relating to impartiality and even-handedness of the consultant toward both parties. It is but one of a series of pieces of evidence that relate to the impartiality of the consultant vis-a-vis -vis the parties. The letter ultimately sent by the consultant following this email was very similar in wording to this email. And Guelph in turn issued a notice of default, terminated the contract, and told Urbicon to vacate the site. At page 55 of the decision, the court looked at the law and distinguished a breach of contract from a fundamental breach of contract. And in the quote uh, 142, paragraph 142, it says that a breach that's so fundamental, so serious that it goes to the root of the contract is a fundamental breach. It was Urbacon's decision that even if there was defaults, which they did not admit, they did not go to the root or the heart of the contract. At most, according to Urbicon, the city would get a complex that was delivered late, and if it was late, the city would have LDs. According to Urbicon, a delay in occupancy does not constitute a fundamental breach of the contract unless the delay is intolerable and the owner, as the innocent party, has no alternative but to terminate to avoid a delay in occupancy. The court looked at this part, these quotes in the factum of Urbicon and accepted the position and fa found that Guelph failed to prove that Urbicon was in fundamental breach of the contract and therefore the decision to terminate was not justified. With respect to the duty of good faith that we talked about in Basson, sorry, at 159, and in 160 of the decision, they talk about good faith. And it says, there could be no serious argument that a parties to this contract did not have an obligation to perform or discharge their duties and obligations under the contract in good faith. So good faith existed, at least in construction law area, before Basson. In the end, the court found that the notice of default issued by the consultant was invalid and did not support the city's notice to terminate. Similarly, the, the city's failure to perform its obligation in good faith under the contract invalidated any justification for the city to terminate Urbicon. 
The court declared the termination to be wrongful and invalid and ordered the city pay Urbacon's damages as a result of the wrongful and invalid termination. Part two of this presentation, and I'll see how I'm, we're doing good for time. Doing great. Great. <laughs> um, talks about claims. Um, and I'm focusing on construction claims, and we're going to start by looking at the 2012 decision, which discusses the importance of giving timely notice. The case is Technicor in the City of Toronto. I call it the Clearway case because Clearway was, it was the general. Some quick facts. All right. Clearway was hired by the City of Toronto to construct a water main. We've got some underground tunneling, which is always good. We got a boring machine, which is terrific. Then we've got a nice flood, and then we got a trap boring machine, which is very exciting, and we have delay. So Technicore is a subcontractor to Clearway. Let's see if I'm going here. They, they say as a result of the flood, they've got a uh, delay claim. So they make a claim against Clearway for $800,000 in damages arising from the flood. The contract eventually gets completed, and on March 6, 07, Clearway itself makes a claim for $1.27 million representing the costs incurred for the flood. The March 07 claim has this caveat saying we might not know all of, all of our damages, but here is our claim. The Clearway claim of $1.27 million included the technical claim of $800,000. Therefore, about 470 was on account of Clearway's own costs. The contract notice provision is a pretty standard uh, notice provision in the contract. And the city, in turn, denied the March 07 claim. I can't remember if they said it wasn't timely, but I can't recall specifically why it was rejected. Technicore, interestingly, sues the city, and the city, in turn, third parties Clearway. The city seeks contribution and indemnity from Clearway and additional damages. Clearway defends the third party claim and counterclaims against the city seeking indemnity for the Technicor claim plus $1 million in damages. So that's about a $570,000 increase from the March 07 claim. After Technicor starts its action in 08, Clearway submits a further claim and this is the August 2010 claim, which included the March 07 claim, plus new claims in excess of $3 million. As a result of the August 2010 claim, Clearway amends its counterclaim and seeks indemnity for the Technicor claim and $3.4 million in damages. So you can see as time goes along, the claim is increasing. The city brings a motion for summary judgment, partial summary judgment, dismissing all of the claims except for the claim that was made in March of 07. The motion judge agrees with, Clear, agrees with the city and reduces Clearway's claim to the amount contained in the March 07 claim, so 1.27. The motion judge focuses on the fact that the August 2010 claim was made well beyond the period contained in the notice provision. The Court of Appeal, a Clearway appeals the decision, and it, it agrees with the motions judge and makes the following finding. There we go. So they say that the notice provision is mandatory, and if you don't comply with it, you're out. The Court of Appeal also examines a case, it's a Supreme Court case, and it's called Corpex. It's not in my uh, PowerPoint, but it's C-O-R-P-E-X. It's a 1982 Supreme Court decision, and if you look at a citation, it's at 2 Supreme Court, page 643, and finds that the notice provision does not have to include a clause which tells the contractor that if you fail to comply with the clause, your claim is, will fail. You don't have to have that kind of warning. The Supreme Court in Corpex held that the notice provision is for the benefit of the contractor and the owner and found that a failure to give the required notice in compliance with the contract prevented Corpex from proceeding with its claim. In Corpex, the 
Supreme Court outlined why timely notice is important, and I'll read you the quote. An owner who is thus informed of a mistake as to the nature of the soil knows that the contractor will probably not drop his claim, and he is enabled to reconsider his position. He can, in practice, be assured that the work will go forward if he wishes. He may conclude another agreement with the same contractor or some other. If he prefers for the work to continue under the new circumstances, he may make arrangements to monitor quantities and costs of additional work so that the payments can be made to the contractor. So basically giving the owner an opportunity to make a decision on what to do now that there's something that's new in the, um, or unexpected. The Court of Appeal in the Clearway case, and in response to the Clearway's position that the city wasn't prejudiced by the delayed notice, stated that proof of prejudice is not required and explained the importance of timely notice in the following slide. And the comments that you'll find on, in this paragraph 47 are very similar to the comments made by the Supreme Court in Corpex. The Court of Appeal in the Clareway case also found that the city was not required to lead evidence of prejudice and found evidence of prejudice and is, I'm sorry, assumed prejudice in certain circumstances. And they talk about a multi-million dollar claim made after um, time required. And I believe there is a typing error. Um, the word if on the first line should be is. In response to Clearway's position that the city waived compliance with the notice provision, the court held that there was no pattern of conduct by the parties over the course of the project, which showed that they did not intend to be bound by the notice provisions, and there was no pattern of conduct by the parties that had the effect of varying or waiving the terms of the contract. So there is case law that says where parties uh, by their conduct um, don't comply with the precise terms um, that could be uh, a defense or a give rise to a claim. The Clearway case is a good reminder to make claims in a timely manner and to carefully review your contract terms and follow the contract terms when making a claim for additional compensation and or an extension of time. The last case I'm going to be looking at is a good summary of what part of your delay claim can be included in a lien claim. The case I'm looking at is a 2013 case called Struckform and Ashcroft. And some quick um, facts. The owner is Ashcroft and they're building a condo in Ottawa. Struckform is the uh, supplier of the concrete form work and services. Again, we have a delay on the contract. We've got change orders, and we have a lien. And in, ter in response to the claim for lien registration, Ashcroft's post security to vacate the claim for lien. St Struck form, bless you. Struck form starts a lien action, and there are two components to the lien claim. You've got unpaid invoices of 725 and additional labor hours, loss of productivity, overtime premiums, and extended duration for 1.9. Ashcroft defends the lien action and counterclaims against Struckform. According to Ashcroft, the lien is excessive and it includes delay costs, which cannot form part of the lien under the Construction Lien Act. Ashcroft brings a motion to get part of its security back. The Ottawa Lean Master heard the motion. We have Lean Masters in Toronto. We have Lean Masters also in Ottawa. And he heard the motion to reduce the security paid into court. And he makes the following comments, which confirms that costs included in a claim must be connected to the work done on the site. Let's see, and that's in paragraph 14. Regarding costs that can form part of the lien, the court says, Additional expenses incurred because the project takes longer than anticipated, such as labor costs, equipment rental, and similar costs of remaining on the job will be readily found to be the basis of a valid lien. Now, 
I know when I look at a claim for lien and I'm asked to put on a claim for lien, to the extent that there are uh, a, a component of a delay claim, I will drill down to find out how those quantums are made up. With respect to costs that cannot form part of the claim for lien, in paragraph 14, I've given you the quote, you can't include lost opportunity costs, loss of profits, or aggregated damages. Let's see. Paragraph 23, we talk about labor costs, or the court talks about labor costs, and it says labor actually used in the, import, in the improvement. The court looked at the formula that Structform used to calculate its costs and found that two-thirds of the additional hours at two-thirds of the hourly rate could be recovered at most at trial and therefore reduced the claim of 729 for loss of productivity to 325. With respect to the claim for overtime, in paragraph 25, they talk about uh, overtime being paid to complete the work. With respect to overtime, they said that the, court, the claim was inflated and found that Ashcroft could not prove an entitlement to overtime for over 100,000. So he knocked down that component of the claim down to 100,000. With respect to equipment rental costs, the court made the following comments in paragraph uh, 27, and it talks about claims for equipment actually on site. And with respect to costs that cannot form part of the lien, in 27, overhead, um, head office overhead, meal allowance, fuel allowance, um, in this particular case, they were not allowed. In the end, the master reduced the claim to $1.8 million plus HST, thereby reducing the security paid into court, which was originally 2.7 to 1.9. As a result of that decision, the owner got $800,000 in its costs, security for costs back. Some closing comments I wanted to say. The general doctrine of good faith between parties and the specific duty of honesty in the performance of contracts as set out in Basin, has already had a very significant impact on the way that construction lawyers plead their cases and deal with one another. I'm not sure if you've seen uh, you know, these, these terms, good faith and, and dishonesty or honesty or duty to act honest, but they're littered in, um, in correspondence and pleadings um, since, uh, since November of 2014. As a result of the importance of the decision, the, the, the importance of this decision has to be communicated within the construction industry so that players know that they can examine the way in which they perform their contractual duties and assess the risks of the way in which they communicate to one another. The same duties, the duty of honesty and good faith, will be applied to the making as well as the evaluation of claims under the contract and including costs and the delay claims in claims for lien. I, I, I see this as a common thread that's going to be in every aspect of uh, the construction project. The honesty microscope has been set up and it would be prudent to consider how one's conduct would look under the microscope before court is called upon to evaluate that conduct. Thank you for your time and patience.